Hi there. My name is Seb Hembest. I'm the Chief Economist at Bloomberg NEF. And Bloomberg NEF is a specialist research division of Bloomberg LP focused on the transition to a low carbon economy. And I'm here today to talk about the New Energy Outlook. The New Energy Outlook is an annual publication that contains a long term scenario analysis of the future uh, of energy. And it draws together work from across Bloomberg NEF. All the work we do sector by sector, country by country, pulled together once a year into this major study. And the New Energy Outlook is um, made up of three different parts. The first part is our economic transition scenario. This is our economics-led story about the future. What we're trying to understand here is what do the underlying technology and economic trends, uh, what do they tell us about the pathway to 2050 when we strip out policy targets uh, and other ambitions? The second scenario is our climate scenario, and this builds on the first uh, to investigate pathways to well below two degrees. And this year, we have looked specifically at a clean electricity and green hydrogen pathway. We know there are lots of other pathways, and in future analysis, we'll of course look at many others, including nuclear, CCS, bioenergy. The final part is a section that looks at the implications for policymakers that emerge from the first two sections of the report. Now, there's lots and lots of ways to cut this study. It's a very large piece of work. I'm going to start by talking about emissions. And the headline conclusion in this year's outlook was that by our numbers, it appears that emissions from fuel combustion in the energy sector may now have peaked in 2019. We've estimated that the emissions drop in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, maybe about 9%. And while we return to growth, we never again reach those pre-crisis levels of emissions. And we can look at this sector by sector. The biggest shock, of course, in the transport sector, but even in the power sector. Overall, when we think about COVID, we're kind of saving roughly about two and a half years worth of emissions at current levels uh, along over the next 30 years as a result of this year's shock and the return to growth over the coming couple of years. I'm going to look at the study now um, from the perspective of fuel consumption, which, of course, is how we get our emissions profile. And if we look at that, we can see that coal, of course, is the source of most of the emissions in the energy economy, but it sees the most change over the next 30 years. Oil is the second biggest. It sees change too, but slower, and gas sees ongoing growth. So let's start with coal. This is a picture that shows primary coal demand by end use sector. We can see that the bulk of end use coal uh, demand is the power sector. Uh, Industry and other applications of coal make up um, a significant fraction. And you can see that on one hand, coal in the power sector, that's the blue area, is declining at the same time as coal in the rest of the economy is growing. And overall, the decline of coal is a, is a story about the power sector. And I want to talk about that now. Overall, this is a picture that shows power generation by technology out to 2050. The headline here is that by the end of the outlook, we see 56% of wind and PV generation. Uh, if we add hydro and nuclear, that gets to 76%, with the remaining fraction being coal and gas. And coal sees the biggest change. Overall, when we think about the shape of the power system between now and 2050, we're talking about a almost tripling in the size of the power system, a significant growth in wind and PV, um, wind capacity growing at about 147 gigawatts on average per year, PV, solar PV capacity growing at about 250 gigawatts per year every year out to 2050. Uh, this makes up about 15 trillion of new asset investment uh, with another 14 trillion that needs to go to the grid, uh, both to uh, pay for expansions of the grid, but also to replace aging infrastructure. There's also around 2 billion invested behind the meter by businesses and households. So we see a real distribution of the system and to smaller scales over the outlook. Underpinning this story, of course, is one of technology. And we can see dramatic declines in the cost of PV, of wind, of lithium ion batteries. And those costs are coming down with increased volume. So as manufacturing volume increases, costs come down and they've been coming down for a number of years. When we take these technology cost curves, we add together balance of plant, uh, financing costs, operating costs, et cetera. We can draw a map that looks a little bit like this, which tells us that pretty much everywhere we look, in countries representing three quarters of world GDP, new wind and new PV is the cheapest new electricity. Not only is it cheapest to build new, but increasingly it's cheaper to run than what's already in the ground. 
And whether we're talking about a coal-heavy economy like China or a gas-heavy economy like the United States, in the next five years or so, building renewables might look cheaper than running existing fossil fuel plants. When we map this forward country by country out to 2050, what we find is there's a bit of a limit in the wind and PV story, um, a limit that gets to about 70 to 80% of penetration um, by 2050, and different countries are on different trajectories. This is a long way off, but we think that wind and PV can make up a dramatic, um, uh, see a dramatic shift in power generation worldwide and make up a very large fraction of the sector by the end uh, of the outlook, by mid-century. What we're describing by that point is a power system where bulk renewable energy makes up, the, uh, makes up most of generation. Uh, we see batteries charging and discharging. We see curtailment, which is just unused electricity, becoming more prevalent, uh, which doesn't matter so much when renewables are really cheap. But there are times of the year when we need to back up that generation with gas uh, and other fossil fuels that are available on demand. And so gas increasingly, as well as some other fossil fuels, uh, make up the firm capacity, the backup that glues the system together. And gas is actually a fossil fuel that grows throughout the outlook. Even though we see some decline in the power sector as it plays this secondary role to renewables, we see growth in buildings, growth in industry. So gas is a growth story, but slower than in the past. For oil, the story is really about road transport, which makes up about 54% of total oil consumption. Of transport, 75% uh, of that is road transport, and you can see here the blue area uh, is the, uh, the transition we see towards electric vehicles and away from oil. We see growth at the same time, though, in aviation, a little bit in shipping and in feedstock for petrochemicals. So overall, oil consumption um, peaks in our outlook at about 2035. To peak early would require faster uptake of electric vehicles um, or slower return to growth of aviation post-COVID-19. The electric vehicle story, like the wind and solar story, is one of technology innovation. And we can see here the growth in electric vehicle sales on the left and the, the fraction of, uh, of the vehicle fleet uh, that is electric on the right-hand side. Uh, and over the outlook, we see electric vehicles start to dominate road transport. But overall, the problem we have is that despite these transitions in power and in transport, we see emissions going up in industry, going up in buildings. And what we end up with is a, an emissions curve that's still far too high if we're interested in reaching two degrees or well below two degrees, um, uh, down to one and a half degrees. In fact, we need to uh, reduce emissions at around 6% year on year to get well below two degrees or 10% year on year to get to one and a half. And our economic transition scenario has emissions coming down at just 0.7%. So the direction of travel might be right, but the rate of change is not nearly fast enough. So we built a climate scenario, and that climate scenario firstly said, let's electrify as much as possible. And when we do that, we get an automatic saving in emissions because we're taking emissions from end use sectors and coal, direct coal, oil and gas use, and moving them into the power sector where we have this strong decarbonisation story. Overall, we save um, uh, around uh, uh, 40, uh, sorry, 120 gigatons of emissions and by the end of the outlook, we're saving about a third of emissions just by electrification alone. When we electrify more of the end use economy, what we end up with is a much bigger electricity system, about double the size than we might otherwise have in, uh, in 2050, um, three times as much renewables. So that means we're talking about 540 gigawatts of PV deployed every year, 375 gigawatts of wind deployed every year to 2050. And to put that in context, in 2019, we saw about 118 gigawatts of PV and 58 gigawatts of wind. So we're talking about five times as much as we saw last year. The other part of this scenario is, of course, green hydrogen. And green hydrogen is a zero carbon fuel that could get all throughout the energy economy. When we think about its applications from heavy industry to heavy transport for seasonal power generation and other things, we find that we would need roughly 800 million tonnes of hydrogen produced by 2050 to complement the electrification and renewable energy story. And that hydrogen, um, uh, uh, hydrogen in the energy system would make up about a quarter of all final energy. And in this scenario, electricity is around 45%. When we add this together, the electricity to make the green hydrogen through electrolysis and the electricity to power the end-use economy what we find is 
we're talking about a 100,000 uh, terawatt hour energy economy by 2050, significantly larger, or roughly five times larger than the electricity system today. And the trade-offs here are material because depending on how we might make that hydrogen, we might need a lot of land with a lot of renewables deployed to make that hydrogen by the green hydrogen route. When we add it all together, it makes up about 3.5 million square kilometres, and that's an area the size of India. So lots of questions still on how we might manufacture the amount of hydrogen we need for this clean electricity and hydrogen economy. Overall, uh, this pathway costs between roughly 70 trillion and 130 trillion over the next 30 years, which is roughly two to three times, uh, two to three percent of uh, G of, uh, of GDP over that period. What that amount of money buys us, of course, is earlier peaks in, uh, in fuel consumption and an emissions profile that keeps us well below two degrees out to 2100. So the new energy outlook is a significant study. These two scenarios help us think about the future. And I hope they help everyone uh, in this event think about the future of energy uh, in, in the sort of detail here that we need to to make the transition to a low carbon economy. Thank you very much.